So, and Stephen, would you uh, agree with that? Because I know there's one point where you say, for example, for you, walking meditation didn't work. It didn't, it didn't strike a chord with you. Would you agree that you should be trying to use a little bit of every meditation technique? Or how would you advise well, someone? To I'm, I'm not a Buddhist monk, Zen master. Uh, my home message is basically do what you can, right? And, and life is different phases. You, you know, Mathieu, I've got five kids and a partner who's working and there's the, the work at university, the hospital. Sometimes, you know, it's just too much. And, and to formally sit down, take 20 minutes for myself in the morning. Well, this morning, for example, Bella, it was just chaos at home and needing to bring the kids to their activities. And, and you know, so, so what do you do? I had the luxury to just um, have a retreat, five days, wonderful. Uh, but one day the retreat stops, right? And here I am in the, in the hospital and, and uh, every formal meditation, you know, stops. And then what do you do? And so I think, and uh, Mathieu uh, will tell the same, that the challenge is to, you know, make this part of your activities in, in, in daily reality, your work and, and how you uh, interact with, with others. And, and uh, there's different ways to do that. Uh, maybe you can compare it with, with, you know, learning to swim in the beginning it, or, or to ride a bike. And, and after a while, you know, you can pick things up. And um, I also had periods and, and with Mathieu, we went to retreat and then you do things quite intensely. Uh, and then there's moments where, you know, I, I would enjoy it differently indeed while... Uh, because mindful walk can stand for different things. You know, you can have these Monty Python, very slow, to me a bit strange, and I don't enjoy it much, but others do, and that's fine. And it's really this personal experience. And that's also yeah. what I see in my clinic. You know, it's, it's easier for me to prescribe a pill. You will have insomnia, you have pain or, or anxiety, whatever. It's the same pill for, you know, this or that symptom, and, and you swallow it, it's looking for an easy fix. When I talk about lifestyle and meditation, it's this journey. And I see different people filling it in different, different ways. You can also do, in, in, in Belgium here, uh, transcendental meditation is also very popular. And, and in the book, there's um, David Lynch, you know, he's repeating this mantra. Okay, so, so uh, trying these things out, I think, I think is useful. And maybe doing simple things differently, like spending your breakfast, brushing your teeth, when I walk with my kids, uh, the, the youngest son, he's, he's nearly as good a Zen master as Mathieu, uh, Louis. I'm not a Zen master. Um, and and he, when he's in the woods, he really is there. And I would be on my phone, or even if I'm not on my phone, I'm, you know, in thoughts elsewhere. And, you know, you can spend a time during a walk, during a discussion, really there. And, and that's a training. And I think it's, it's no magic bullet. It's something that maybe you know, deserves more attention. Um, and, and then you can just cultivate it, as, as Mathieu said. But I would not put the bar too high. Uh, no, I was going to say, I'm more practiced. And I saw Mathieu as well wanting potentially to come in. Has the moment passed, Mathieu, where you wanted to, to add? To no, I said, but no, I was just saying I'm not a Zen master. I'm not a master at all. Ah. No, <laughs> what I was saying is that, uh, you know, even in the, in the Tibetan literature, that means not for a public that's already within that sort of frame of mind. It says it is better to do repeated short periods of meditation rather than try to do very long ones from time to time. You know, it's like if you learn the piano as an amateur, if you do 10 minutes every day, but regularly that you'll get somewhere. If you decide every, every two months to spend the whole day, probably you'll get tired, you know, you, you will be stuck, not being able to progress at all. Or if you water your plants, you a little bit of water every day, not a bucket every month, it would die in between. So that can be done any time. I remember when I was at Pasteur Institute and I'd already traveled to the West. I mean, I would easily find a little cubicle where I could be a bit quiet and I would spend 10, 10 minutes just uh, turning my mind, thinking of my teacher and try to you know, settle my mind and grow some space and grow loving kindness and whatever practice I was going to do. 
And if you do that, even short periods of time, but for a few times in a day, even two minutes, it set in motion something. You know, it's like a trickle of water that doesn't stop. And slowly we say, drop by drop, it fills a big vase. Uh, what is not very useful, and I think in neuroplasticity is the same, is to do very intensely something that you don't know how to do from time to time, because that there's no time for the brain to change. And also the mind doesn't change if you push it too much. But little by little, gen you, know, you can get somewhere. So this is there's a Buddhist saying that there's no big difficult task that cannot be broken into small easy tasks. So this is fascinating for, on two uh, counts, I, I think, for me. First of all, I heard um, uh, uh, someone called Richie Davidson, who, who's a professor of psychology and, and psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin. And he, funnily enough, as, as he's researched a lot on, on meditation, he said almost the opposite, which is so fascinating to me. He said, actually, the research that he had done suggested that a 10-day or a five-day retreat once a year was more beneficial, obviously in the short term, not forever, but was more beneficial than sort of one minute a day. And it's fascinating to hear that in the Tibetan, um, go on, yes. please interrupt me. Now, which is, co is completely right. I mean, he has been the study that people who do retreats for 10, 15 days, uh, that's very uh, helpful for you know, giving measure shift in your way of seeing things, in your commitment to the practice, I have done five years of, you know, if I had all the months of solitary retreats, and it's completely different. Even the, the what half an hour, say from 6.30 to 7 in the morning, if you know that you have the whole day ahead of you, and if you know that you're going to be involved in a lot of things. What I was meaning is that uh, what would be no good is just to do very intense eight, eight, seven hours, one time, not in a retreat situation, you know, like, trying to run a marathon without having trained at all. Now, this being said, if you could combine, you know, every day, a little bit here and there, different times of the day, and then take a time out 10, 15 days, then that would be ideal. And which studies show that it is very important to have this time where you, your mind is completely onto that. It's not simply because of the change that will occur in those 15 days, but the frame of mind Will be different you will start to appreciate the quality of spending time with the practice quietly leisurely getting fully into it and that will make you, know, you start to appreciate things differently to value things differently so it's not contradictory <laughs> yeah okay so exactly so the two yeah absolutely um it's interesting because Stephen, you mentioned this this idea of it's easier to prescribe a pill and, and you have a quote in the book from Jonathan Haidt who says, suppose you read about a pill you could take uh, once a day to reduce anxiety, increase your contentment, would you take it? Uh, the pill exists, it is meditation. Um, it's interesting this that, that quote because it feels like there's a few things to unpack there. It, in a sense, um, trying to talk about the, a pill like that in any case as meditation as a pill seems to me not quite right because meditation takes effort it takes work whereas popping a pill in your mouth takes very little effort so in our world of hyper optimization constantly trying to perform the best uh, and trying to do it in the quickest and least uh, i guess least effort you know with the least effort we we possibly can is it the case that we look at a pill and if meditation were truly a pill, we would all be taking it, but actually it's the work, the effort that's involved that is holding us back? Well, it really depends uh, what is your need, right? So if I see patients and, and they come see me because they have a, a symptom, um, it can be anxiety or, or depression or burnout or tension, headache, chronic pain, uh, sleeping problems. Uh, so that's a very specific context where of course, by training, I, I'm prescribing pills or, or interventions. Or, um, and that's wonderful to have this medical know-how and, and high-tech you know, interventions that is really improving our quality of life. And it, it's important to emphasize. But uh, I think medicine today and tomorrow will also empower the patient. And, and we can, we're all potential patients, we can do things and, and, and have an impact. And so it's very complementary. Uh, now, we need more controlled clinical trials just with a pill compared to placebo with specific indications, counterindications, side effects. 
well, that's what we need more. Um, and, and it is clear, you know, if you have hypertension and, and we have a lot of the diseases are caused by uh, our bad lifestyle and our arteries are, are um, clotted by, by uh, arteriosclerosis and, 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 you know, we met strokes. And, and, and so to me, it's just part of common sense, taking care of your body, your mind, quality of your sleep, of your relationships, what you eat. Um, and, and that is, is very complex interaction between mind, brain, body, immune system, um, even at the level of the chromosomes. In the book, you have this um, illustration of how, you know, we see effects on the level of the, the telomeres. Um, but the, it, just, just describe what the telomeres are for those, for those who don't know. So, so if you look at people who meditate uh, and you would measure these little caps that this is, again, Mathieu knows uh, about, this is his area of expertise, they, they would protect your DNA. And when you get older, um, they become smaller and then you become more vulnerable, develop diseases. And it seems that when you're with chronic stress and worry, this, you know, um, has an impact. And meditation can, and it has been repeatedly shown, uh, have an influence. So it, it's interesting. We can really see the effect of the different things we talk about. We call meditation um, at the level of, of the, the mind and brain and body and immune system if you give people the vaccine. Um, so it's, it's wonderful that now more and more evidence is, is building up. And, and then there's the medical context. And of course, a lot of patients tell me, well, it's, it's a pity. I discovered this, you know, when I had my tension headache or whatever. I, and, and why not? And I think definitely in the West, we should invest more in, in preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's many ways to, to fill the gap. Do you think from your perspective as a as a as a as more as on the science side of things as a clinical practitioner, do you ever think there's a danger that in this Western context, we can lose something about meditation um, when we see it as a, a clinical tool to try and achieve something in the in the mind? Um, I'm talking, I guess, about the ethical context within which a lot of meditation practices were conceived when we we're talking about altruism. You know, we we tend in the West to perhaps use it as a sort of personal life hack almost. Yes, of course, you can see it as something to just boost your creativity or increase your focus, concentration, be in the flow and, you know, work better, harder, longer, um, or to just deal with stress uh, or as Mathieu has been emphasizing, you know, to, to train compassion and, and loving kindness. And th there's really all these different angles. And, and, and uh, again, it's just like sport. I mean, we shouldn't oblige everybody to start running. No sense that we, we shouldn't all be running a marathon or, or some people prefer, you know, cycling, swimming, uh, playing football, whatever. But it's probably true that each and every one of us, we, we could move a little bit more. And, and just to become aware of that, I think, is a, is a great first step. And then it really depends on your own personal needs and, and how you can do this. By reading a book, by joining, um, you know, going to some coach or, or courses or um, there's wonderful apps. Um, and I see many patients coming back and, and, and you know, wonderfully well done. And also Mathieu uh, offers um, the, 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 this app and, and, and then other people would just become nervous from this technology. So it's a very personal journey depending the, on your needs. Yeah, the apps are very interesting because to an extent, some of the apps, um, I mean, I, I have Headspace on my phone. I've been using that for a while. I've also tried the 10% Happier app. Um, it, it's really interesting because some of them have this sense of gamifying the process. Mathieu, I'd love to hear from you whether you think that is almost counterproductive to what meditation is trying to do if we're trying to achieve the next level. Oh, Mathieu, you're on mute. Sorry, Mathieu, I'll just stop you there. You're on mute. Well, I can, you know, again, we overuse the word meditation. So we did the app for or it's more like a course called Imagine Clarity, which is more about the whole course. It's not just a little half with performance and there's nothing to do with performance. And this idea of performance is exactly what the pill is about. You know, a pill for meditation is like doping is to sportsmen. You know, you can enhance your speed momentarily. It doesn't replace uh, years and years of training but you could become a superman for, for a, a short time. And so that's what, those are, are functional change, not structural change. You don't change in, in depth. Likewise, you know, some people who suffer from epilepsy, you put electrodes in the brain, you open the brain. 
you can have incredible change. You can make people completely depressed or ecstatic, but the moment you pick up the electrode, it goes off. So the training is a lasting change, slow, but definite change. Mm. So that's what it is important. Yeah. And I think meditation again is mind training and we hold every mind, we all deal with it from morning till evening and uh, it could be our best friend or our worst enemy. So we don't mind doing 20 minutes of physical exercise because we know it's good for physical and mental health. But if you tell you, you should also have this kind of immune system of the mind, more emotional resilience, balance and everything. Uh, you say, oh, I don't have time. It's like you have a sickness, you go to the doctor and he prescribes a treatment and he says, no, 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 doctor. First, I don't feel well. Second, I don't have time. So it's precisely when you are stressed and don't have time that you should work with your mind because it is the mind that translates all the outer condition in misery of well-being. So it's difficult to change all the other conditions as you wish, but you can change the way you experience it. So I'm, I'm very puzzled why we think it's a kind of superfluous thing, a kind of luxury. Well, if it changes everything, the quality of relationship, the quality of your sleep, the, the enjoyment of life, moment for moment and over the long period of time, so the mind can override the outer condition. You can feel miserable in a little paradise, everything you have, beauty, wealth, renown, and feel terrible. And you can feel full of joy even in difficult circumstances. So it's quite clear. Mm, that's very interesting because this idea, is, it, it recalls something in the book, uh, Stephen, about this, uh, this sense that it is not the, the situation that is the problem. It's the way that you approach and, and respond to the situation. Um, so the, the British writer Tim Parks, who you have as a testimonial in the book, uh, talks about his uh, journey through meditation to alleviate physical chronic pain. And I think you say that the meditation isn't taking away the pain. It's not, it's not reducing the physical pain. It's simply changing his appreciation, his attitude towards that pain. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So, so that's... Um... A wonderful story, I think, uh, where again he, he he found some some way to deal with this differently through through meditation. And um, again, it's not a magic bullet. And 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 this this personal journey. The only thing you really need is is to to you know be curious, try it out, be be, be motivated. Uh, for example, in in our hospital here, would also use hypnosis. Uh, another illustration of the power of the mind. And I think. In our hospitals, in, in my profession, um, as a healthcare worker, we're, we're not uh, maybe uh, using the full potential of really this power of, of the mind. We have over 10,000 patients now who had surgery. So this is thyroidectomy, so removing the thyroid gland or uh, breast tumor, and you are just laying awake on the table. But in this um, hypnotic state, you know, um, enjoying pleasant autobiographic memories. And, and we published that it really uh, decreases your need of, of painkillers and your uh, hospital stay would be shorter and your blood pressure changes and so on and so forth. So uh, to me, there's all these different ways, uh, including meditation. And, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, we all have a mind, as Mathieu says, uh, it's a wonderful tool. It makes us, you know, do, do these great things but sometimes it, it spirals and it can make me anxious and, and, and uh, sleepless and, and even yeah push me to suicide. I have two colleagues we're, we're a profession at risk of burnout and, and they committed suicide and we know this for so long and still structurally I think it's still emphasizing you know knowledge knowledge uh, and, and, and what about the experience how do I help others when I never actually learn how to listen to my own emotional needs and we know there's something like emotional intelligence but what is really offered not just in medical school but uh, mm -hmm. all schools for that matter yes.